Well, good evening. We have put Brother Steve at a disadvantage. He has to pick songs that we all know and with no hymnals, so good luck with that. But you know what? The really good ones rise to the occasion, don't they, when you put pressure on them. So that's why I wore this suit tonight. People have said, why are you wearing a suit? I said, well, I'm trying to up the standard of this Wednesday night group a little bit. Not really. I'm just kidding. Just glad you're here. Glad you're uh, comfortable. I had a funeral today, as Jerry mentioned. Need to continue to um, pray for the Neals. Just a blessed time there. Pastor Ron and I conducted that, and um, just uh, it's a it, it's always a celebration of a life when it's a, somebody that knows the Lord. Amen. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to share a, a personal sports moment that I had when I was younger. It was 1980. And I stood at the dugout opening of Blackwell Field. Remember Blackwell Field? I don't think they call it Blackwell Field anymore. It was at the University of Charleston. And uh, it was a lot of great anticipation uh, because I was anticipating something that had eluded me time and time again during my young life. A championship. A baseball championship. And the score was deadlocked at one run apiece. And um, there were two outs, and it was the state summer high school league championship game. We had one runner on first base, and our ninth hitter was up to bat, and he had two strikes on him. So it, it looked like there would be no more joy in Mudville. Um, the tension was elevated by the fact that just the night before, that same scenario with that same hitter, with the same amount of outs, had happened just down the street at Wapal Park. And um, in that situation, the, the hitter hit a line drive to center field, to the center fielder, and he came in and made a shoestring catch, forcing this final championship game. And it was, uh, boy, the nervous tension was almost unbearable for the hundreds of spectators who were watching the game and their, their respective small towns that they were representing that had advanced to this climactic moment of the state championship. My teammate, his name was Jeff Nelson, and he had the pressure of the world as a young man on his shoulders in that moment. And I understood his fear and his courage because six years earlier, I was in a little league uh, championship game. Again, it had eluded me because I, I had faced uh, a batter in a crucial situation and struck out twice with the bases loaded <laughs> in the championship game. And, um, you know, it was, uh, so that was a, a moment that, that brought a lot of anticipation. And now, years removed from that original painful event, um, by the way, the, uh, a guy came up to me, the league president, after I struck out twice as a little leaguer, and his name was Big Bill, Bill Ellswick, former Marine. Well, there are no former Marines. You're always a Marine, right, Tom? Um, he was, he, was a, a, he was a railroad guy. He was rough, and he, he put his arm around me. He was the umpire, by the way. He put his arm around me, and he said, don't, don't get down on yourself. He said, Babe Ruth struck out three times with the bases loaded in the seventh game of the World Series. And I felt better until years later until I found out he was lying to me. <laughs> Babe Ruth never struck out three times, but it made me feel good at the time. And... Um, so here we were, years removed from that event, and I stood with my teammates and hundreds of fans with our eyes fixed on the number nine hitter, and we awaited the next pitch. 
Tonight, I want to speak to you on the subject of, and I want you to turn with me there to Hebrews 12, on what we trust in. Do we trust in God or do we trust in ourselves? Look at the passage of Scripture there. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses, let, me, or let, us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, or some translations say the author and the finisher or the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten my exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son... Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have have to endure. God is treating you as sons for what son is there whom his father does not discipline. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this... We have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? Now skip down to verse 12 and 13. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Father, we thank you for your word and the time we have together. Lord, we pray that you will bless the reading of it. Lord, give us direction. Help us to see the beautiful picture of grace. It is by grace that we are saved and it is by grace that we are kept and it is by grace that we must live. Lord, help us to look at this honestly and help us to yield to the Holy Spirit of God for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. The writer of Hebrews here is bringing uh, a warning and an encouragement in the pages of this letter. He was, in essence, closing the door on the dispensation of law and, and, and beginning here to establish the importance of the dispensation of grace. A dispensation is simply... A period of time where man is tested with regards to a certain um, revelation of God's will. And in this case, it was the dispensation of law that they had come through. Um, and, and now the dispensation of grace, it, it actually stretched from Mount Sinai all the way to, to Mount Calvary. And 1 Corinthians 12 was really a letter to encourage them with regards to this new hope and grace that they had. When the Bible speaks of the law, it refers to the detailed standard which God had given his people. He gave it to Moses beginning in Exodus 20 with the Ten Commandments. There were a lot more than that. There were over 600 total commandments. But God's law basically explained his requirements for holy people, and it included three categories. It included the category of civil law, ceremonial law, and also moral laws. And the law was given to separate God's people from heathen nations. Uh, we see that in Ezra 10, 11 and Romans 5, 13 and Romans 7, 7. And the law also clearly demonstrated, as we all know, it clearly demonstrated that there's no human being who is capable of purifying himself enough, of working and doing enough to make themselves in a pleasing situation to a holy God. The law basically revealed that we needed a Savior. Now, I want you to look at a couple passages here with me. Uh, the first one is in Mark chapter 7. Turn to Mark chapter 7. We see the religious leaders had hijacked the law and they kind of added their own rules and traditions. 
in, in Mark 7 and, um, and verse 7 through 9, it says, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of, man, of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your traditions. Now I want you to look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 and verse, verse number 3. We see while the, the law was good, it, it lacked power. It lacked the ability to, to redeem mankind. So in, Mar, or in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3 it says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh so we see here the picture here of how how the the law was inferior in accomplishing salvation now it wasn't bad all the way around um you know keeping the law as interpreted by the pharisees had become oppressive to the people and uh, it had weighted them down. There's actually, let me show you one more verse. Uh, Luke, turn back to Luke. Luke chapter 11. Uh, or turn forward to Luke. Luke chapter 11. And verse 46. I'm going to read this to Tony um, Stroud the next time I see him. And he said, woe to you lawyers. That would be funny if you knew that Tony was a lawyer. And woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You see, he was talking there about the Pharisees, those who were uh, being very restrictive with the law. And so when Jesus comes on the scene and he, in, and he issues grace, I mean, there was a conflict waiting to happen. Um, he was going to come up against these hypocritical arbiters of the law and it was inevitable that they were going to clash and but Jesus the lawgiver he said this in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 do do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them and so we see here that the law it wasn't evil but the law was intended to be a mirror and what the mirror did is the mirror basically showed mankind the condition of their heart and showed us that we could not, I mean, for, look in, law, in 1 John 1, 17, the Bible says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus embodied the perfect balance between grace and the law, according to John chapter 1, verse 4. So tonight, I want us to look real quickly at three things that, three roadblocks, if you will, that prevent us many times from trusting in God and His grace in our lives. The first roadblock I want to give you here is, and, and I, want to, I want to try and relate these to that day in the, in the dugout. As I was looking out, and I was perplexed, and I had all this tension on my life you know a lot of times I look out the dugout of my life and I'm you know we all do that and we're we're fearful about what's happening on the playing field because we feel like we can't do anything about it we're just sitting there and we're watching this go down and we know our past we know we've never won a championship before so why should it start now and so I want to kind of parallel some of that anxiety I was feeling there in 1980 with some of the realities here of the roadblocks I believe we put in front of ourselves. Roadblock number one, I had difficulty that day because I believed that I had never experienced the big win. I think a lot of believers um, are like that spiritually. I mean, when it came to baseball, I'd experienced some, some, some wins but not the big win. I'd had some small moral victories. I'd had some small sport victories, but I'd never achieved the ultimate prize in West Virginia high school baseball, a state championship. And in our text, these Hebrew believers had experienced some joy under the law. They had experienced some satisfaction under the law, but nothing that they did was able to 
to ultimately satisfy them. They always knew that there was, there was something else. There was, they were longing for the Messiah to come and, 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 and settle this with grace. You know, the difference, if you will, between the law and grace is the law says, I will love you, as an illustration, I will love you after you cut the grass, let's just say. But grace says, I love you. And by the way, I already cut the grass for you. So Jesus Christ did what we couldn't do, what the law couldn't do. Grace is not based on what you do. And winning big spiritually means experiencing God to the point that when you're frustrated and when, whenever you're, def- you, you, you're, you're, you're frustrated about something, you're never defeated. Though you're fearful, you're, you're always anticipating victory. Now, if you've ever played sports, you'll know what I mean when I say this because in sports, there's a difference in playing to win and playing not to lose. Because when you're playing not to lose, you're always defensive. You're always on the defense. And no matter how good things are going, you're always expecting things to turn south and go badly because you've never experienced the big win. But God's grace... When we understand God's grace, we realize that we already have the victory in Jesus. The pressure is off. It's not what we do. And that's when God gets involved, when we give him the glory for that. That's when your marriage will reach new heights. That's when your ministry will explode out of control. Hebrews 12, 29, there's a, there's a great verse that says that God is a consuming fire. Now, Think about that in reference to whatever it is that you're facing in life. Whatever it is that that brings you anxiety. When we position our problems where God alone can receive the glory for it, he becomes a consuming fire. He consumes those things. The heat of his holiness will melt the barriers that stop communication and, and relationships from going forward. When we uh, seek to give him the glory in situations, the light of his love will shine through the bitterness and other things that prevent um, the, the, the things in our life from bringing blessing to us. Now, the key here in all of this is we have to come to the point where it's not about us. We don't care who gets the glory. We want God to get the glory. We don't want to receive the glory ourselves because when you think about it, As a believer, when we talk about a big win, the big win is not what God will give you or give me. He is the big win. He is a relationship with him. That is the ultimate, ultimate prize. You know, no matter what it is, uh, a a difficult uh, project that you're working on it in your job, And man, it's just been bombarding you, bombarding you, bombarding you. Well, you realize that God has placed you in that position to be uh, an eternal witness for him. You know, we've said so many times we are God's witnesses in these areas. But ultimately, the big win is not whether I get the promotion or whether I get the job done or what. That's not the big win for me. The big win is the fact that God gets the glory for the efforts that I make. Let me give you the second roadblock that was difficult for me as I stood in that dugout that day and, I, and also in our faith is roadblock number two was I believed that my happiness rested on another. Um, it, it is hard in sports or life to just not be in control. Um, I'm a fixer. I like to have the bat in my hand. I like to be the one who is trying to affect change. Look at the text again. He says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary and faint heart or faint hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You know, when we read this, we're reminded that Jesus did all the work for salvation. Someone has written that the world says, Don't just stand there, do something. But God says, Don't just do something, stand there. Now, we must use the resources and the opportunities that God's given us, that he lays before us, but we must leave the results to God. 
We, there's this divine cooperative and we go forward. God's given us, I was talking to somebody the other day about the, the responses to COVID-19 and what churches are doing and this and that and what we're doing and asking all these questions. And, and the person said to me, well, you know what, we just need to kind of, you know, let go and let God. And I said to that person, I said, well, God gave you a brain. You got to use that too. You know, we have to evaluate things. And, and, and that's, that's true. Paul actually he had the right perspective of it. You see, Paul understood that they had to, had to, we have to be involved in the work of the ministry of taking the gospel forward and being a witness to others. But in the end, it's up to God. Because what he said was this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 8. He said, I planted and Apollos watered but God gave the growth. See, what was going on there, some people were saying, well, Paul, he's the one, he's the greatest, and Apollos, no, Apollos is the greatest. And, and what Paul says is, look, he said, I planted the seeds of the gospel. Apollos came along, he watered the seeds of the gospel, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the, uh, gives the growth. You know, most of us have trouble letting go. And God has specific ways to execute his plan on earth. And look here, sometimes he takes the bat out of your hands and he puts it in someone else's hands. And those are the times you have to trust in him. And all you can do is watch. But you know what? That's the wonderful picture of when the Old Testament law was there. Remember when, when, I, when we did the study in Leviticus about uh, the scapegoat? Remember that? And they would bring the, the scapegoat in and they would, they would, the priest would just pile the sins of the people. He would pray and pile the sins of the people on that goat. And then he would, then, then he would send that goat out into the forest to be gone. And the people would look at that and all they could do was watch they didn't do anything it was a picture of christ who would come one day and take the sins of the world the other goat was sacrificed and we know jesus christ came and he was sacrificed for our sins so regardless of the outcome god is in control now finally let me give you the last one here roadblock three was i didn't know what the outcome would be Fear of the unknown causes anxiety. Look again at verse 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. As I nervously stared out of the dugout with my friends and teammates, the umpire brushed off the plate and the pitcher sat himself for the delivery. The spectators held their breath. The players began to pray and our unfortunate teammate who was under pressure at the plate, Jeff, dug his cleats in and he glared confidently and with determination out at that pitcher. The pitch came, the bat swung, and in the words of Yogi Berra, it was deja vu all over again. Because the ball went on a line drive toward the center fielder. The center fielder broke on the ball. He came running in. At the last second, he dove to make another shoestring catch and dash our hopes again. And for some reason, maybe angels in the outfield, I don't know. But the ball scooted under his glove and went all the way to the fence. Our runner on first base easily scored uh, from first base to win the game. And he emphasized it with a Pete Rose belly flop. I can see him doing it today. And we won the game. And in that moment... We were West Virginia state champions. And I finally experienced what I felt, what, what, I'd wanted to, what I wanted to experience, that big win. So let's review my roadblocks and our roadblocks as believers. Roadblock one, I believed that I had never experienced the big win, but I had. Just the very journey of participating and competing all those years was a huge win. Having teammates 
that I'm still in touch with to this day. And as believers, no matter what's going on in your life right now, you have the big win if you have Jesus Christ. Because he is the prize. Roadblock number two, I believe that my happiness rested on another. I thought all I could do was sit there in the dugout and watch. And in that situation, physically, that's all I could do. There were things I could do. I could cheer my teammate on. And, um, and, and as we look at life, we have to realize that God has given us a testimony. God's given us the gospel that we need to take out, that he, we are ambassadors for him. God pleading to others through us. And roadblock three, I didn't know what the outcome would be. You know, God's plan of victory was formed before the foundation of the earth. Listen, Satan is skilled and he will often snatch the so-called line drives that we hit. But guess what? You've already won the game. Satan may attack our country and our homes, but even if it takes eternity, he is defeated. He may attack your emotions, but you will win as a believer in Jesus Christ. He may attack this ministry, but my Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, not Satan. He is a defeated foe. I want to give you one last scripture and then we'll go home. Revelation chapter 20, verses 9 and 10. Revelation 20, 9 and 10. I call this Satan's last stand. This is his last stand. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verses 9 and 10, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now, as I read that, I think about all the different scenarios we find ourselves in where it feels like we're about to lose. And then it says, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever don't ever forget whose team you're on you're on God's team you're on the winning side father we thank you lord for the victory that we have in Jesus and we thank you lord that we are to be engaged on this earth but we are not to sink our roots in this is not our home we are to share the gospel and to plead with others and to be a testimony. But even in doing that, Lord, we water and plant, but you give the increase. We can rest in that promise. Help us to go forward, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing that. Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory you have a great rest of the week.